Hey y'all, my name is Priscilla and welcome back to my channel, Bookie Charm. For today's video, you're gonna be joining me, I guess, as I react and read the Octofinals round of the inaugural nonfiction book toot prize. So um, this is my first time judging the book two prize. So I'm super excited. And the books that I have been assigned are here. So the first book is The Only Plane in the Sky, An Oral History of September 11th, 2001 by Garrett and Graff. Admittedly, I didn't really have this book on my radar. I wasn't really planning on reading it, but oral histories, I think, and I tend to get along when it comes to history books. I think those are the ones that I uh, gravitate towards the most, and I could get along with this book. So um, I'm excited to try it out. The next book is called Furious Hours, A Murder, Fraud, and the Last Trial of Harper Lee by Casey Kep. This is another book that I was not even anticipating on reading. I have no idea what this book is. I know Harper Lee is the author of To Kill a Mockingbird. Never read that book. It wasn't assigned to me in school, so I really have no connection to Harper Lee at all. So according to Goodreads, this is the stunning story of an Alabama serial killer and the true crime book that Harper Lee worked on obsessively in the years after To Kill a Mockingbird. So this will be another one that may throw me for a loop. Okay, the next book is called Parkland by Dave Cullen. This is one that I was highly anticipating. I have been meaning to get to Cullen's other work called Columbine. Unfortunately, he seems to be the expert on mass school shootings. And he is a journalist that writes books about these things and is very good at it because he gets a lot of praise for his books. So I'm actually really excited to get to this book. The next book looks really interesting. It's called Guest House for Young Widows Among the Women of Isis. Um, I'm not familiar with this book, with this author, but that title sounds really interesting. Apparently this is a story of an account of the 13 women who joined, endured, and in some places escaped the Islamic State. It's uh, based on some very immersive Pulitzer winning prize journalism. So I'm super interested in this book already. The next book I think is gonna be the toughest sell for me. Uh, it's called The Ministry of Truth, The Biography of George Orwell's 1984. I have only read one book by George Orwell. I read Animal Farm a few years back. Never read 1984, never really felt a connection to George Orwell's work or compelled to read more of his work. So this is gonna be tough for me. I also am not really that huge of a fan of biographies, but I'm taking my role as a judge very seriously, so I'm going to go in with an open mind. The last book I have is Rough Magic, Riding the World's Loneliest Horse Race by Laura Pryor Palmer. Okay, so this is a debut memoir that is going to be following a young woman who travels to Mongolia to compete in the world's longest, toughest horse race. And in the description, it says it's for fans of H is for Hawk by Helen McDonald. That's a book that I've anticipated for a while that I've been meaning to read for a while. So if it's related to that, I might get along pretty well for this book. And the cover is also pretty beautiful. I actually like this color palette. So uh, that's a good sign, hopefully. So three out of the six books I feel like are kind of my, in my wheelhouse. The other three I feel like are going to be a little bit more challenging, but I do have high hopes and let's see where this first uh, judging round will take us. Okay, so today is January 31st and I have started one of the books. I started Parkland by Dave Cullen, which was probably the easiest way for me to start because I was already looking forward to this book and I already had a bit of history and context with the book just following the news and being familiar with the kids that are behind the movement that this book sparked and that um, Cullen is investigating. So uh, initial thoughts, I'm about 45% through this. I am listening to the audiobook while reading this hardcover at the same time and I like how early on Cullen makes a point to say that he's not going to humanize the shooter, the attacker, the murderer in this event. 
and he doesn't even call him by name. He kind of talks about these murderers, these gun violence perpetrators as a class of people more so than an individual. And I really like that distinction as well as he names each of the children. There's like five high schoolers that kind of sparked this activism in school shooting. He names each of them and talks about them individually in this entire book. So I really like that. I like that you can tell Colin just has a great wealth of knowledge and background in this. He mentions a lot of his information and differences with the Columbine shooting and how now 20 years later we're still talking about gun violence in schools. I ended up uh, googling and YouTubing a couple of interviews with the kids and just kind of getting that picture in my head so I can see each of them more individually. I could see Emma Gonzalez because she just has a striking presence. She's also bisexual and Cuban so she's always kind of stuck out to me but I wanted to get an idea of what all the other kids look like so I ended up YouTubing that. Maybe I'll include a clip here but um so far so good well i just filmed two videos with that spec on my camera so that's great let's check in with the first book that i finished which was parkland by dave cullen i really enjoyed this book and um, obviously it's going to start out top of the list of my rankings so i'm really impressed with how cullen was able to uh, cover the events of the Parkland event and also the start to this movement, the March for Your Lives movement, and follow these kids for a couple of months, but what actually felt like years. These kids are inspirational, and I know why they got so much media attention now because they did all of this in the matter of a few months, and it's so, so impressive. So, you know, we follow them not only as they start the March for Your Lives movement but also as they graduate and have fun at prom. And I really liked that uh, Cullen doesn't shy away for any, from any of those hard topics. Uh, the kids got some criticism, you know, for being, you know, white mostly or white passing and very rich and affluent. And they didn't take that lightly. They went ahead and started organizing with the kids that have been doing this work from other cities that just happen to be people of color. So they organized and it created a network of activism, which I think is really important. And also even from within their own school, when some of the other kids in the school said, you know, we were there too, and we haven't even been invited to your group to help. And so they started bringing in some of those other uh, kids of color into their group in their fold. That all I think is really important when you're talking about topics like this. So all in all, I think this was a really great start, successful start to my uh, book two prize reading. I did think it was clunky at times um, just because uh, this is a very linear writing style and with the number of kids that he had to follow and the number of interviews he had to do, I don't know how he was gonna uh, make sense of that. It's just kind of broken up by numbers within many chapters. So it felt very clunky at times to me, having all those different voices interject in the same chapter and the same topic. But um, overall, really, really great start. And uh, I highly recommend you read this if you're interested in it. Okay, and I have also already finished my last book. I finished Rough Magic by Laura Pryor Palmer. This is a memoir that follows a 19 year old British woman that on a whim decides to apply to the Mongolian Derby, which is described as the longest horse race in the world, the hardest, roughest horse race in the world. This memoir is good, um, not great. I think that Lara tries to paint this picture that she, you know, decided to join this on a whim, but I feel like obviously she has equestrian, an equestrian background. She has an aunt that is an equestrian, um, winner uh, a great um, person in the sport where she's from and she has access to horses and training and things so i don't feel like this was really on a whim i also googled how much this entrance fee cost for the derby um the mongolian derby and in 2020 the registration fee is eleven thousand pounds which i think is roughly fourteen thousand dollars so what kind of whim do you have to be on to register for this horse race but that's besides the point the book itself follows her when she decides to on a whim join this race and then throughout the entire race and you know that she's going to win from the start of this book she and goes on to win she goes on to be the youngest person to complete the race and i think the first woman to win the race so um it's interesting but there's just this sense of entitlement throughout the entire book that i did not mesh well with 
you know, there's there's so many instances in the story where Nara just mentions she just didn't know anything and she expects people to explain these things to her. She goes, uh, she flies across the world, of course, to compete in this race because obviously she got accepted and didn't realize that, that that was something that she'd have to follow through with. So, okay. Um, so she goes to this training and just these questions that she asks um, at this pre-training with all the other writers and the hosts and the doctors and veterinarians. She's very underprepared, you know, for a race that could last up to 10 days. She only brings one pair of clothes. Um, you're going to be on the elements. <laughs> it's going to rain the first day that it rains on her. She has to sleep um, the next day naked because she has no clean clothes and she gets a rest on her thighs. So I just was really frustrated with that sense of entitlement kind of string that kind of went through and weaved throughout the entire story. I understand now why people struggle to rate memoirs because this is her story and while she is very entitled she is also very aware of that entitlement because she does mention the possibility of this being problematic, the race in itself being problematic because most of the writers are westerners and I will add most of them are white and um, a lot of the horse, all the horses that they ride are somewhat wild. They are um, provided by local herders and while these herders appear to be very happy to um, be a part of this race to have um, these riders ride their race th through their homes through their uh, through their rural areas um, it's it's still problematic in, in a sense and she's aware of that she's aware of the impression that she gives other people because she uh, describes their disgruntled shocked faces when she says something stupid so um, it's tough for me to rank but I, I do sort of uh, rank books and rate books based on how much I enjoy them. So this one is going to be hard for me, but I have mixed feelings about it. I will say though, uh, she mentions The Tempest in this book quite a bit. I think that's where the title of this book comes from. She opens the book with a quote and uh, that's the only book that she brought with her during the race. This book makes me want to read The Tempest. <laughs> so um, that's a positive from this book, but there's just a, a lot of entitlement in this, a lot of arrogance in this story that was really hard for me to um, grapple with, for me to um, let endure to get to, to the good parts of this story. The Mongol Derby is so fascinating. It follows the trek of Genghis Khan in the 1200s. So that's kind of what it's inspired of it, the courier trails that Genghis Khan's riders took. And that is all fascinating, but just damn, I could not get on board with uh, Palmer's words with her voice it was really hard to get on board with. Uh, that's enough rambling on about this book. I've already started my next book, but you'll see in the next clip what I think about that after I've read a little bit more of it. So I'll see you in the next one. It's been a few weeks since I updated y'all on my booktube prize reading and I've already started editing this video and I know it's going to be very long. So, so sorry. I have completed another book. I finished Guest House for young widows. I have been struggling with how I feel about it and how to talk about it. Um, it's a book that follows 13 women of ISIS and it's a journalist perspective. The author is Iranian American and she has been writing about the Middle East, about ISIS, about jihadists, and about the Middle East for decades. So she's a pro she really knows her shit and um, the book is formatted in a way that I think detracts a bit from the overall arcing message from the story here. 13 women is a lot. That's, that's a lot of women to interview over a span of a number of years and to get a narrative that you can follow. And, it, and I felt like I wasn't getting everything because I was constantly reorienting myself and trying to remember who was who and where we were in time and what was happening next with whom. So it was hard for me to keep track of things. This is a book that definitely I don't think a lot of people will get along with just because of the structure. Um, the author also, like I said, has been writing about the Middle East for decades. Oftentimes she interjects into these women's stories and she has pages of history lessons, but then we'll shift right back to these women's stories and while I think it does enrich the story, it does give that context that the Western, average Western reader will need to understand what's going on. It also kind of is distracting. And I think that because it happens so much, 
because it was so much detail, I felt a little bit more confused than anything else. But I, I know this sounds like a rant, but I, it was such a good book. It's so important. I just wish that the structure had been more fine tuned and maybe that she hadn't included so many women. I know that in the author's note in the epilogue, she mentioned that she actually interviewed 20 women and she actually cut it down to 13. So I, I felt that in the book though, that there was just so much information that she wanted to cram in and she tried her best to do, but that you, you can't keep, I think, a reader's attention and um, understanding with that many different stories going on. So overall, I feel like the story is great. I think the overall message is that most uh, people outside of Islam, outside of ISIS and the Islamic State uh, perceive women in the Islamic State as being naive, as being coerced or kidnapped or worse within that state. But the women that she interviewed most often were actually actually chose to go to this ISIS, to, to be a part of ISIS in the Islamic State. And they felt empowered by being in the presence of an Islamic state where they were accepted and they weren't ridiculed and um, discriminated against. Whereas in their home countries, they often were for being Muslim. Um, I think that Noor is one of the women that I followed and the most uh, event that happens to her when she's a young girl and where her nijab, I think it's called, I'll put the word here, I'm probably mispronouncing it, is ripped off of her or threatened to ripped, be ripped off of her in school. And it, it's terrifying. That happens to her as a young girl and I feel like that uh, empowerment is what she gained by going to the Islamic State, by marrying into uh, this 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 place. And, um, but oftentimes that uh, Islamic State is uh, contrived and manipulated and contorted and, and wrapped in misogyny and uh, toxic masculinity and things that Islam does not stand for but are often painted as what Islam stands for. So I think that, I don't know if that even makes any sense. <laughs> that, that's how scattered my brain is after having read this book. But um, good, but I wish it had been better. <laughs> I'm going to be completely honest with y'all. The reason why I haven't filmed in a week or so is because I feel like I hit a, a brick wall and I picked up um, a book that I'm not getting along with and is completely out of my wheelhouse and is super challenging for me to read. And that's The Ministry of Truth, the biography of 1984 and George Orwell. This book is so dense in history and it's very dry. It's it's written in two parts and the I just got through the first part, which is the heavy part of the history and up to the point when George Orwell publishes and writes uh, 1984. Um, I will say that this book starts off with an amazingly strong and immediate and timely introduction comparing the importance of 1984 and how it kind of researched um, with the 2016 election of Donald Trump and how this uh, dispelling of truth and this idea of truth being manipulated. We heard, you know, things like alternative facts and um, these new ideas of questioning what is true and what is fact um, were resurfaced and resurfaced a new uh, generation of readers to pick up 1984 again. And uh, that was a super strong introduction, but that first part of the actual biography just was so long and so dry. And I have high hopes for part two, but I've taken a break and I put it down so that way I could come back to it again and not go into it with a bunch of the negative things and connotations that I currently have for it. That's where we are. Wish me luck for the rest of these books. All right, hey y'all. Well, this is gonna be my last check-in for this video. And if we've gotten this far, I think we've gotten pretty comfortable with each other. So I have a lot to update you on. <laughs> so much has happened since the last time I checked in, I turned 30, so it was my birthday. Pandemic is a normal word to use in everyday conversation. And we're all social distancing, I hope. So, I put on a little bit of makeup today for the first time in what feels like at least two weeks. I do feel a little bit normal. I also got this fabulous ring light for my birthday, so I'm working out some new lighting, etc., etc. Let's talk about the books. 
So since when I last left off, I was reading The Ministry of Truth and I did end up finishing it. I don't really have a lot more to say about it. I kind of feel the same way. It was just really dry. Part one is a good chunk of the book. I wanna say at least 60% of the book is focused on part one, which is the biography of George Orwell. In part two, it talks more about the uh, impact of 1984 after it was published, where it went, what people were saying about it. And in the epilogue, there's a lot of discussion about where it sits in culture and in our contemporary times now, how it has influenced and how people are seeing a lot of that fascist, maybe socialist uh, political discussion with our current political climate. So it's very interesting, just so dry, so boring. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Next, I want to talk about the book by Casey Kep, which was Furious Hours. I tried to read this book so many times. I checked out the physical book from my library, picked it up, put it down. I picked up the ebook, put it, picked it up, put it down. I picked up the audiobook. I tried so hard and this is my one and only DNF. This, much like the title says, is a true crime book about a murderer and it dwells into his history, his life in the first part. And then the second part takes a completely different turn and it reads like a completely different book. And then in the third part, we follow Harper Lee covering this crime. I started to skim and realized I really wasn't invested in this book, so I don't have a lot to say about the nitty gritty details. I do think that Harper Lee being a bigger name that people are more aware of and her being on the title is a bit of a selling point for this book. I don't think this book is going to be ranked very far, very high, and I'm certainly not going to be ranking it very high because I DNF'd it, but I did give it my all. so. That's where I stand with that book. And of course, the last book that I have finished I want to talk about is The Only Plane in the Sky by Garrett Graff. So this book was so, so good. This book is amazing, but I feel like it's hard to recommend this book, especially with the coronavirus and everything that's happening right now, because a lot of the paranoia, of the panic, of the um, just fear that a lot of the American people had during 9-11 and that are reflected and discussed in this book, I feel parallel what we're fearing, feeling now with this pandemic. My own anxieties, I think that I didn't know where I was prominent with everything that's happening right now, kind of leaked out having reading some of the, the fear that people express in this book. So it's a hard book to recommend. Definitely wouldn't pick it up if you're not in the right mental space, if you're feeling a lot of the same anxieties that I'm feeling. After the 9-11 attacks and once people realized they were terrorist attacks, um, there was this feeling, this general sense of a, clo a quiet and slow panic kind of just blanketed over the United States. And I feel like that's kind of what we're dealing with right now that perfectly exemplifies and expresses how we're feeling now. So like this says, this is an oral history of 9-11, the entirety of its day from the beginning of having a blue clear sky. It was described as such a beautiful day in New York City before the planes hit the Twin Towers. And there's a lot of archived information in this book from the planes that are being hijacked for to phone calls that people on the planes made to their loved ones from the towers as they were burning and as they collapsed to the ground. There's um, archived information from the president's, uh, George W. Bush, his uh, nightly address to the American public. And then many years later from uh, Barack Obama as he was addressing the um, the task, the Navy SEAL task uh, that killed Osama bin Laden finally all these years later. That's all fascinating. This book is also a bit of a resource because there's a lot of uh, photos in here. Very nice, um, nicely printed, uh, high quality photos. And um, so I really, really enjoyed this book. There's a lot of trigger warnings in this book, um, just general PTSD. There's a lot of gore and violence and things that I had not read about, seen on TV. Uh, about the, the horror that people faced on this day. I remember 9-11 pretty vividly because I was in sixth grade, so I was in that age where I kind of had an idea of what was going on, but it kind of unfolded um, 
throughout the day and it was a really scary time. And I remember right before I left for school that morning, we were watching the news. My grandmother was watching the news and the first plane had just hit. And as we were about to leave on live TV, the second plane hit the Twin Towers. Hearing the live broadcasters just shocked, um, oh my God, expressions and uh, feeling that same way and not knowing what the rest of the day was gonna look like. So I went to school, people started being taken out of school. I remember our school library was full of parents wanting to take their children out. Nobody knew what was happening. Some of that is covered in this book. I'm surprised how um, Graf was able to interview some students at the time. Um, their reactions and feelings surrounding this day and I felt even reflected in that. So it's just a really well researched book. Uh, there's a lot of information. Some of this is, is just heartbreaking. I mean these are the last moments of some heroes and it's really hard to read but it's really really good. I think it's gonna fare very well for the booktube prize. So that is all I have to say about all these books and my booktube a prize reading. I will be voting for my ballot and placing my ballot later today. So I'm excited about that to see what the next round looks like. I have also volunteered to be a judge for that round so we'll see if I'm called. Overall I'm really happy to have participated in this round of judging. I found some really wonderful books that I'm going to be recommending in the future and it was also a really good challenge and I'm always up for a really good challenge especially when it comes to nonfiction reading. That's all I have for this video today. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to catch you in the next one. Bye!